this presentation extracts from a manifesto intended to make the argument for a parametric or constraint-based approach to videographic scholarship. Videographic scholarship refers to the audiovisual analysis of audiovisual and screen material, often, though not necessarily, in the form of video essays. Videographic scholarship is increasingly mainstream in screen studies and takes a range of forms from the explanatory lecture to something closer to video art. I'll illustrate the kind of videographic scholarship I have in mind here with excerpts from three video essays. They illustrate what I mean by a parametric or constraint-based approach to videographic scholarship. Each identifies a dimension or an element of the source text and submits it to a strict set of formal procedures. This algorithmic process then generates both the analysis and the presentation of that analysis, the video essay. And this brings me to the cyborg in my manifesto. For me, the employment of parametric procedures implies a distribution of cognitive and scholarly agency beyond the individual scholar human. A parametric videographic scholarship can constitute a post-human mode of knowing, a mode of knowing that emerges with and from the assemblage of computer hardware, parametric system, editing software and scholar human. In her famous Manifesto for Cyborgs of 1985, Donna Haraway wrote that we are all chimeras, hybrids of machine and organism. The challenge is to imagine a scholarship that speaks from this cyborg position and doesn't just speak about it. And in writing another cyborg manifesto, I want to argue that a parametric videographic scholarship can do this. The title of this new cyborg manifesto is Workshop of Potential Scholarship, or Uskalpo. In its complete version, it takes the form of a long essay followed by 10 propositions of 50 words each. Here is the first of these propositions, and an extract from the second. My title alludes to Lipo, short for Ouvroir de littérature potentielle. Workshop of Potential Literature, founded to explore constraint-based approaches to writing. Ulipo proposed the acronym OEXPO to envisage possible fields, designated by X, that might themselves adopt parametric procedures. I have in mind a videographic Uskalpo. Uskalpo names a creative erotics of videographic practice, a scholarship that is playful and willfully banal, experimental and performative but non-productive, even wasteful. Catherine Grant draws on Susan Sontag to describe her videographic scholarship not as a hermeneutics, but as an erotics in which the scholar has a sensuous engagement with the objects studied. Grant talks of an active handling, a gestural use of editing, and of how the use of editing software creates a sensation of virtually touching the film object as a digital or digitized artifact. Grant draws on Barbara Bolt to describe her practice as a form of understanding with the hands and eyes, which operates in a different register from the representational paradigm of man as subject in relation to objects. A work like Dissolves of Passion is then a record of this material thinking, this process of understanding with the hands and eyes. In Dissolves of Passion, Grant distills the film Brief Encounter to its 64 cross dissolves, which are presented sequentially and in slow motion to reveal each of them as a film within the film. This intense act of too close reading, to use a term from D.A. Miller, transcribes Grant's and others' intense engagement with Brief Encounter as retrospectatorship, a mode of viewing shaped by the experiences, fantasies, and memories it elicits in the spectator. I'm not there. 
erotics, unlike a hermeneutics, implies a sensuous engagement with the phenomena studied. A scholarly poetics of making, of remix, mashup and manipulation, not primarily interpretation or explanation. Sensuous engagement also with the tools of study, where subjectivity and agency is distributed along the editing platform and algorithmic action of generative constraints. Videographic scholarship in the mode I am describing offers not critical distance, but critical proximity, or rather critical intimacy. Because the action of the hands and eyes that Catherine Grant describes is one with the affordances of the editing interface. And because this action obeys the constraints of the parametric system, I would describe this critical intimacy as a cyborg erotics. As Donna Haraway writes, intense pleasure in skill, machine skill, ceases to be a sin, but an aspect of embodiment. The knowledge fashioned through a videographic erotics is procedural and creative rather than propositional. It suggests not, given this, what do we now know? But having made this, what can we do next? By making performative interventions rather than arguments, a cyborg erotics is less concerned with the elucidation of existing objects than with the creation of new objects and even with new forms. Matt Payne's Who Ever Heard is constructed around 16 looped two second chunks from a scene in The Man Who Shot Liberty Balance each distributed across a nine-screen grid with special attention paid to the rhythmic superimposition of dialogue and other diegetic sound. Whoever heard surely succeeds in achieving its creator's stated goal of drawing attention to genre repetition vis-a-vis -vis editing repetition and of highlighting the kind of symbolic work that genres perform. But for me, the work's true interest lies elsewhere in the foregrounded collaboration of parametric system and organic creator-curator. Who ever heard of a man waiting on table? Who ever heard of a man waiting on table? Who ever heard of a man waiting on table? Who ever heard of a man waiting on table? Who ever heard of a man waiting on table? Who ever heard of a man waiting on table? Looking at the new waitress. Looking at the new waitress. Looking at the new waitress. That's my steak balance. That's my steak balance. That's my steak balance. That's my three against one. 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 That's my three I can invoke Matt Payne's video essay to exemplify a workshop of potential videographic scholarship because just as the writers of Ulipo try to invent new literary forms and to develop generative structures to enable writing, whoever heard proposes itself as a form to be adopted by other videographic practitioners. It says, take this form and see if you can make with it, satisfying the constraints it imposes. See what can be made with it, allowing yourself to be surprised by the content it generates, and see what you can make of it, allowing the form itself to evolve and be refined. And indeed, this challenge has been taken up by other videographic scholars. He's a very strange young man. 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 He's a very strange young man.
He's a very strange young man. He's an idiot. Understand it not as knowledge production but potlatch. A practice in which precious resources are expended for pleasure or to challenge another, another human scholar algorithm, to outdo the act of waste in a further expenditure of creativity. As I've said, the knowledge fashioned with the videographic erotics is procedural rather than propositional. What the practice offers to know are the mechanics and steps of its own making. And this knowledge may be offered as a gift or a challenge to other videographic scholars. Let me discuss the mechanics of my own video essay, No Avoiding Time. For this piece, I took a digital copy of the film Inherent Vice and divided it into its individual component shots. I divided my video essay frame into four screens, which corresponded to four image tracks on the editing timeline. I took each individual shot from Inherent Vice and inserted it on the four track timeline in the furthest back available space. The procedure was something like a simplified game of Tetris. The result is that the film is compressed into roughly a quarter of its original length and diegetic time gets folded back on itself. You have some idea, I imagine. I don't know what this is. What is it? Is it Chinese? What? You being what you Chinese. Golden thing. It's a syndicate quality. No, 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 I'm the house. In fact, maybe I'm going to join your oh, syndicate. Oh, you don't be. I'm going to for tax purposes. Oh, oh you're so sweet. Ah! Just a little cookie. Doctor, I think there's a problem with the couch in your office. Where is it? And bring that bottle. You tell Sandra you're friendly with them. Doc! What do you think of my chompers? Doc! Heroin sucks the calcium. I'm back. Dr. Rudy. Like a vampire. You're not Dr. You're Rudy. not Dr. Rudy. Right. Recalling that Japonica here had been pretty pain. open and shut, runaway daughter Partly where they had insisted on paying when having a bonus for father Crocker Clan. Escaping mostly. Chris Skyler escaped. Dr. Her father Rudy. Crocker, also known as the Dark Prince of Palace Fair Days, was a lead lawyer at the office of course. Hi. Smile makes me chick. Driving oh, one all car. of which you all have been exhibiting. Thank you, sir. And he's in Mr. Sportello, and as long as Ronnie wants to. I'm actually going to have a heart attack. I'm actually, my heart is racing like a little bit. Really so oh, yeah, I'm in an evil mood myself tonight. I've spoken of No Avoiding Time as my video essay, but actually I felt that in making it, I was not imposing my scholarly will on the editing platform or parametric procedure. I felt instead that I was cooperating in the undertaking of the scholarly investigation and the platform or procedure were not so much tools as collaborators. And the capacity of knowing was distributed along a continuum of scholarly agency. In fact, the greatest degree of scholarly agency could well be claimed, not by me, but by the parametric procedure itself. Stacey Alimo has pointed out that agency is usually considered within the province of rational and thus exclusively human deliberation. To recognize that scholarly agency may be distributed beyond human deliberation is to accept that a cyborg scholar's activity of knowing may take non-intentional, irrational, and so non-argumentative forms. Imagine a gerund of scholarship, a knowing doing, that goes beyond knowing how to knowing with, or perhaps an unknowing, a scholarship that makes nonsense of things. Uskalpo is absurd as to methods and typically outcome because it expresses a distributed subjectivity. It opens prospects inaccessible to the merely human scholar. I'm not going to